friends and members of the Episcopal Churches in Osney. My name is Cooper Conway and I am the priest in charge. Welcome to our service of morning prayer. Send out your light and your truth that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, as it was, was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. And now we will say together the Venite. Come, let us shout to the Lord. Let, let us, us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Your word is a lantern to my feet. And a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined. To keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips. And teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand. Yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me. But I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes. Forever and to the end. The lesson is Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 34. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if this is the way it is to be, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born to be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all bloody, like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. 
When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of the red stuff for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. What use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went away. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Here ends the lesson. Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers. You are worthy of praise. Glory to you. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple. On the throne of your majesty, glory to you. Glory to you seated between the cherubim. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you beholding the depths. In the high vault of heaven, glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble 
or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, I would like to begin with a poem by Yahudi Amachai, who was an Israeli poet of the 20th century. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard, but doubts and loves dig up the world, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. This morning, we hear the parable of the seeds falling on different soils. But when we hear this parable, unlike the other parables with which Jesus shares with us in the Gospels, we are also given an explanation of what the parable means. Jesus tells us what the parable means. How convenient, we might think, on hearing the interpretation. Now we don't have to guess. We know what Jesus is getting at. We have some certainty. But really, I ask you, how helpful is that? And why bother telling the parable at all? Why didn't he just say, well, when you hear the word of God, open your mind, live with it, let it affect you gradually, put other things aside and focus on it alone. If that's what the parable means, why didn't Jesus simply say that to begin with? Because we believe Jesus never said that at all. Oh yes, he offered the parable of the seed and the soils. But most probably, he never gave a correct interpretation. The interpretation was added along the way by one of the gospelers, most likely Mark. And what did this interpretation do? Well, According to members of the Jesus Seminar, who have weighed and analyzed the words of Jesus in the Bible to determine how likely it is that Jesus actually said each of them, according to that academic group, the addition of the interpretation of this story moves it from the world of the parable to the category of an allegory. And so they conclude Jesus did not interpret this parable because it was not his custom to speak in allegories. So what is a parable? And what is an allegory? A parable is a story which lays one thing against another, usually a familiar everyday situation against a more abstract concept. So, the mustard seed is compared to faith, or misspent wisdom is laid alongside a pearl cast before swine. As a result, the parable is an open story, which invites the hearer to be active, to apply their own experience in order to learn the parable's lesson. This opens the parable to exploration, and shades of difference in understanding. Now, an allegory is a story with a single hidden meaning, and once you know that meaning, you know the answer. 
parables can be visited again and again, mind for meaning, over and over. While allegories are learned and stored away, much like facts, parables are vague, like fairy tales or dreams. They invite us to play. Allegories are certain, like arithmetic on a basic level. Think the times tables. We learn them, we stash them away, they are certainties. But are certainties really all they are cracked up to be? About 10 or 15 years ago, I went to a dream seminar in North Carolina. It was a unique and challenging experience where the speakers and workshops were put together to help attendees to question and communicate with our dreams and the dreams of our fellow students. In this time, the story I remember most clearly was one told by Jeremy Taylor, a longtime and well-regarded interpreter of dreams. And this is what he told us. One day, a woman came to him and she spun out before him a long and complicated dream. Now at the end of the dream, the dream story, she said to him, Dr. Taylor, I wonder, is this dream telling me that my mother never gave me the support that I needed as a child? Well, Jeremy replied, it depends. Did you know your mother was unsupportive before you had the dream? Oh yes, the woman said. Well then, he told her, I would suggest that the dream has another meaning. His point, I believe, in telling this story was not to say that the dream did not refer to her childhood challenge, but to say that it might also carry a new and yet to be discovered piece of wisdom. Like dreams, parables and their images carry many levels of meaning. They don't deal in certainties and known facts. For I ask you, are certainties really all they are cracked up to be? It's great to know the parable of the seed and the soils. It's great to know that it's about the word of God and how we receive it. But couldn't it also be about God's grace and whether or not we per perceive it in our daily lives? Or about God's judgment and how we defend ourselves against that? Or if the seeds are daringly seen as something we find threatening, Maybe they could be God's people from other cultures in this land and how we react to them and treat them. My point is, there are still so many things we can learn from this story if only we don't shut it down with a single answer. You know, the past months have not been a time of certainties and answers but rather a time of questions. There's the story of COVID and its questions like, how does it spread by breath, by touch? Is it, a, it, is, it is a story that is horribly protracted and without certain answers at this time. Then there is the current and necessary physical isolation, which raise questions for us like, when do I come out and how? And will things ever be as they were? And then there is the now more ever visible racism in our nation and its questions like how did we not see this sooner? Or what am I about what am I going to do about it now? Or where do I start? Or what's the next step? questions 
We are living with them daily. In times like these, when questions abound, how helpful is it to be thinking on the allegorical level of holding a single right answer? Remember Amichai's image. The place where we are right is hard and trampled, and we will not find our resilience there. Let us rather, at this time, choose the world of the parable. The place where Amachai says, our strong house is ruined, our right answers are dropped, and our ears are open hear the whispers of God. Let us try to live with this uncertainty. Because maybe, just maybe, certainty, though nice, is not all it's cracked up to be. And now, let us say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God commands us to love one another. In baptism, we promise to seek and serve Christ in all people and to strive for justice and peace. Let us now honor those vows and pray for our nation in this election season. For wise and just leaders and for the needs of all the nations of the world. We pray for continued blessings on peacemakers, on leaders who value peace and on all who promote nonviolent solutions to conflict. God of peace and gentleness, hear our prayer. We pray for the strength of heart and mind to look beyond ourselves and address the needs of our brothers and sisters. We pray for the rural and urban poor and for an end to the cycles of violence that threaten our world. God of generosity and compassion, hear our prayer. We pray for all nations, that they may live in unity, peace, and concord, and that all people may know justice and enjoy the freedom that only God can give. God of liberty and freedom, hear our prayer. We pray for an end to the growing disparity between rich and poor, and for the grace and courage to strive for economic justice. God of all gifts and blessings, hear our prayer. We pray for an end to prejudice throughout our country, that we may respect all people as precious children of God, both in our hearts and under the law. 
God of fellowship and equality. Hear our prayer. We pray for a reverence of creation that we may have the tools and the will to conserve and share it, and that we may become better stewards of the earth. God of nature and the universe, hear our prayer. We pray for all immigrants, refugees, and pilgrims from around the world, that we may welcome them and treat them with fairness, dignity, and respect. God of justice and hope, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, the aged, the infirmed, and the disabled, that all may have access to proper health care. God of comfort and healing, hear our prayer. We pray for all prisoners and captives that a spirit of forgiveness may replace vengeance and retribution. God of absolution and mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all children and families and particularly for the orphaned, neglected, and abused and those who live in fear of violence or disease, that they may be relieved and protected. God of children and families, hear our prayer. We pray for the reconciliation of all people and for the church throughout the world that it may be an instrument of your healing love. God of outreach and restoration, Hear our prayer. We pray for all who have died as a result of violence, war, disease, or famine. God, save us from hardness of heart. God of eternal and resurrecting love. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Watch over our country now and in the days ahead. Guide our leaders and all who will vote to make your ways known among all people. In the passion of debate, give us a quiet spirit and a courageous heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and may also have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. Almighty God, you have, have given, given us grace at this time, time with one accord, to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised it through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen.
gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love, make haste to be kind, and the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.